As a historian, gender studies has had a defining influence on my discipline for more than 35 years. Many historians trace the cementing of gender studies to Joan Scott's iconic article titled Gender, a Useful Category of Historical Analysis. It was published in 1986. A main point in Scott's article is that when we talk about gender, we're really talking about power. So as a historian with a vested interest in understanding how power has structurally operated, gender serves as a unique analytical lens. Of course, there's a much larger cast of influential thinkers beyond Joan Scott, both historians and from other disciplines. And as with any major intellectual undertaking, there have been a variety of different approaches to gender over the past decades. For every two academics in a room, you'll often find 15 different opinions on the same topic. And this has certainly been true for gendered histories. I'll therefore use the rest of my time to talk about what gender-focused ideas and methods are inspiring my own research at the moment. My current project has two central aims. Existing scholarship generally traces the roots of intersectional forms of gendered thought to the United States and to a lesser extent to the Caribbean. The first aim of the project is to explore how intersectional frameworks for gender analysis emerged out of a global set of connections between knowledge producers, policy makers, and activists that existed beyond the borders of North America. The second major aim of the research is to examine how these ge geographically expansive systems of intersectional thought often did not become institutionalized. They were instead regularly marginalized, sometimes from the very spaces out of which they initially emerged, such as the United Nations women's movement. In their place, what scholars have called neoliberal feminism and white feminism gained ascendancy in core spaces of policymaking, including within many governmental and academic administrations in the North Atlantic. The second main aim of the research is therefore to understand how the systemic marginalization of a global set of intersectional gender frameworks took place. Methodologically, the project draws from a few sets of scholarship. First, it uses long-standing techniques from women's history, as well as from queer history, black history, Latinx history, and more, to retrieve forgotten actors and epistemologies from the margins of the past. Second, it draws from feminist histories of science, and in particular, the field of agnotology, or the study of culturally produced ignorance, doubt, or forgetting. It does so in order to analyze how, why, and under what conditions the eclipsing of global intersectional frameworks has occurred within policymaking and institutions of knowledge production. So here's one example. In the late 1980s, a Zambian feminist attorney named Sarah Hupakele Longwe wrote one of the first ever gender analysis frameworks. These frameworks were intended to help institutions put gender-based policies into place and conduct reviews of their own operations in order to make them more gender sensitive. The gender analysis framework that Sarah Hupakele Longwe wrote was adopted by a number of institutions, including Oxfam. Oxfam is one of the largest and most influential international aid organizations in existence. So at the core of the long way framework for gender analysis was the idea that gender could not be analyzed along a single axis of oppression related to biological sex or to the social meetings that we attach to it. In other words, the long way framework argued that gender analysis frameworks could not only look at a narrow definition of gender. They have to also include intersecting issues like class, racism, colonialism, and more. So Oxfam adopted the long way framework for gender analysis in the early 1990s, but then officials at the agency argued that it was too radical. So they unadopted it, and they replaced it with a gender analysis framework that was written by a team of researchers at Harvard with input from the World Bank and the United States Agency for International Development. The Harvard framework put forth a much more limited analysis of gender, among other things, it promotes neoliberal visions of gender-focused policymaking, and it locates women's emancipation within our embrace of laboring in for-profit markets under capitalism, which is probably a very familiar story to many of you. So what do we take from this story? First, gender is not a static, stable, or monolithic set of analytics or methods. It has emerged from particular historical contexts and political movements. And I don't only mean the obvious movements it's attached to, like feminism. I also mean capitalism, decolonization, and more. Second, I argue that we need to pay attention to the often boring, mundane, and bureaucratic pra practices through which institutions have adopted and normalized certain frameworks surrounding gender, 
often at the same time as they've erased, ignored, or sidelined other frameworks. As in the case of the long way framework, understanding which gender focused frameworks have institutionalized at certain points in time and which have not, better helps us understand the fraught politics, assumptions, and aspirations embedded within the forms of analysis that we continue to use in the present. One of the prompts for speaking today was to reflect on what gender studies can offer to our respective disciplines, in my case, history. It's well established what gender can offer history. As Joan Scott said 35 years ago, when we talk about history, we're talking about power. This was then and still is a critical intervention in my field. But like a typical unruly academic, I've attempted to flip the question around today. What can history as a discipline offer to gender studies? At a most basic level, it shows us that gender does indeed have a history, and this history has often been contested. Gender as a set of concepts and methods has changed over time. It's emerged from particular contexts, and it's also a site where power has operated and continues to operate. This, I would argue, provokes important and also very timely observations and questions for those of us who are deeply committed to gender studies and its future. Thank you very much.